Hey Hazel, as promised, I'm very quickly back for the second part of chapter 19, the chapter 19, part 2. Uh, Thomas and Hector have just enlightened from the bus, haven't they? Um, like I said, I found that chapter quite emotional. Hector has found some things out about May Lee's life that he had no idea of, and he'd only ever thought of her prior to this. Um, as a teacher's pet, as he called him, certainly would never have befriended somebody that he felt slotted into that category. Hector is having a real awakening here uh, about A, what May Lee's been through in her life, what it's like for Catwoman and Thomas and probably all the other homeless people that we have in our society. Uh, and... Yeah, like I said, he's having an awakening, I think, and uh, I'm sure we're going to see some great differences in Hector as we get towards, we're almost at the end of this book now, but we shall see. So they, they've gotten off, oh, and he was also, fe he was feeling uncomfortable, wasn't he, because he's dressed as a homeless person, and he's now been looked at and regarded as one by a young girl with headphones on on the bus stop, wasn't it, so... Let's see. Okay then, so. Starting to shiver, I moved my arms and legs and feet to try and make myself warmer. Just as I was wondering if we were even going to make it to the cathedral before dawn, a bus rolled up beside us. A big N15 glowing out at us from the front. The woman muttered, finally, and pushed past me and Thomas onto the bus. It made me want to stick out my leg or something and trip her for being so rude to Thomas, but he held me back and let her pass. Remember, eyes down, pass up and keep close behind me, whispered Thomas before stepping onto the bus and showing his pass. I held mine up too, but the woman behind the wheel didn't seem to care and was driving away again before I had even got up properly. We'll stay down here, said Thomas, grabbing a seat next to the door. It's just three stops now. I silently sat down next to him. Right at the back of the bus in the corner I could see someone half lying down on the seat, a coat covering up the top part of their body. London, it seemed, was full of night riders. Next stop, Chancery Lane. Next stop, Shoe Lane. At each stop, the doors opened to let people off and let gusts of air blow in. I was feeling quite hot now that we were back on a warm bus, wearing so many layers, and was glad we were sitting by the doors. Thomas had his eyes closed, and I wondered if he was thinking the same thoughts as me. Thoughts like, what were we going to do if we were wrong, and the invisible thief never showed up? Or what if they had been and gone and we had missed them completely? Next stop, Ludgate Circus. That's us, whispered Thomas. As the doors glided open, I shuffled out after him and onto the empty street. Looming before us like a giant stone ship was St Paul's Cathedral. Except instead of being white and still, its whole face had been turned into one big cinema screen. Constantly changing pictures of men and women in army uniforms flashed up onto its pillars and bricks and across its golden clock that told us it was nearly 11.45. It was the VE Day celebrations, just like Catwoman had described. Grabbing my arm, Thomas pulled me behind the corner of a shop and whispered, Let's keep a lookout from here for now. The concert had ended, so the cathedral should be empty. Keep your eye out for any strange movement. Remember, we don't know if they might try to say, take something from Queen Victoria over there or target something inside. If we're at the right church, that is. I peeked around at the giant milky white statue of a woman with a golden crown on her head. She was carrying a stick and ball as if she was off to play rounders. Maybe this really was the place the, the sorry, maybe this really was the place the thief would try and steal from next. He would find it super easy to hang down from the Queen's neck to take all her sports equipment. 
As we waited, I looked around to see if there were any lumps, pretending to sleep in doorways that might suddenly start moving and wriggling like a human plant. But there weren't. There was only a couple holding hands and walking towards the cathedral on the other side of the street, and they were giggling loudly. Thomas, I think we're at the wrong place, I whispered, tugging on Thomas's arm. The traffic lights and building lights and everything are all working. Nothing's been switched off. Oh, that's what that food does, isn't it? But Thomas was looking up at the cathedral and grinning. I think we're at exactly the right place. Look, up there. The light inside the cathedral isn't on. What light? Thomas pointed up to the second row of pillars that stood above the cathedral's giant doors. See the window there, he said. Well, it's always lit. In all my 20 years on the streets, 20 years, and on the buses, I've never seen it go to a single night without being lit. Maybe they switched it off tonight because of the VE show, I suggested. Thomas shook his head. That light wouldn't be switched off today of all days. It's meant to be a sign of perpetual hope to everyone who sees it. I think your thief is already inside, picking out something priceless to steal. Even more priceless than the Queen's golden stick, I asked, wondering what on earth could be more expensive than an actual stick made of gold. Infinitely, whispered Thomas. We need to hurry. Come on, there's no one around now. Moving quickly, Thomas led me past a row of shuttered shops and up to an office building, standing directly opposite the side wall of the cathedral and surrounded by a row of short black gates. Behind the gates at the top of the stairs, next to a shiny black office door, was a golden sign with two swords crossed like an X and the words, Administration Offices of St Paul's Cathedral, stamped right across it. Glancing around to check we were still alone, Thomas opened the swinging gate. But instead of climbing up the ste steps that led to the office door, he turned to go down some steeper steps that looked as if they led to an underground cave. I followed him down and we reached a smaller door with a small round window above it and a much bigger window next to it. Thomas looked down at me. Think you can do it? It's the only way to get in without being seen or setting off any alarms. I wanted to shake my head. It was a crazy idea. How was I supposed to fit in through that tiny round window? I was way too big. And that window was too small and high and probably not even open. But I thought of Maylie's warning that the plan was brave and would work only if I was too. So I gave a silent nod instead. Shh, wait, said Thomas, freezing. I froze too. On the pavement above us, we heard footsteps ringing out. They crossed over us and faded away into the distance. OK, nodded Thomas, helping me take off my rucksack, my puffer coat and my dad's scarf. Keep the hat on, just in case, he whispered, giving it a pat. Now. Remember, there's no alarm on the window because it's so small. Just push through gently, make sure you land safely, and then come unlock the big window for me. Remember, you have to press the green button on the wall. If you don't, the alarm will go off when you try and get the latch open. OK, I whispered, too scared to say anything else. Brave lad. Thomas whispered back, handing me a small torch. Hoisting me up onto his shoulders, he balanced himself and me as I reached up and touched the round window. Just like he had promised, it swung inwards at the touch of my fingertips. I tried to pull myself up to the opening, but my body was too heavy. Higher, I whispered. Thomas groaned as he pushed me up just high enough for me to hook both my arms inside the opening. Pulling my body through until only my legs were sticking outside, I hesitated. Then, with a deep breath, I tipped myself forwards and landed with a thump 
and half a head roll onto the carpet below. It was a good thing Thomas had made me keep my hat on. Switching on the torch, I found the room on my right that led to the front windows, just like Thomas had described. Reaching the huge white curtains shielding the windows, I pulled them aside and saw Thomas waiting outside, stroking his beard so hard that it looked as if he might put it right off. On seeing me, he gave a thumbs up. I found the green button on the wall, pressed it and, grabbing the latch, slid the bottom half of the window open, oh, sorry, up and open. Dumping his own coat and hat and my rucksack, rucksack outside, Thomas knelt down and squeezed into the room like a shadow. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit excited here. Brilliant work, Hector, but you're never to do this again, he said, patting my arm. This is the last time you break into a historic building. I grinned, wondering how many detentions Mr Lancaster would give me if he could see me now. Now, are you sure you don't want to wait here? whispered Thomas. No, you promised I could not catch him. You sure? I nodded like I had never nodded in my life before. All right then, stick close. Leading me out into the corridor, Thomas stopped at a small wooden door under the stairs. He swung it open to reveal an empty cupboard. Hold the torch steady, he whispered, as he knelt down beside a large metal trapdoor that was built into the floor, just like he had told us it would be. Remember, don't breathe in too deep. Short breaths until we get to the end, OK? It's important to keep your breaths short and consistent to save air. It's not a long way to the cathedral, but it's underground and it's deep and slippery, and that can make it feel long. At least that's how I remember it from the days I used to work for the archives team. I was too excited to reply and Thomas was too excited to wait for an answer. I held the torch as still as I could as he grabbed the metal ring and slowly lifted the trapdoor open. Beneath it was a short flight of stairs that led down into a pool of dark nothingness. Here we come, Paul, promised Thomas as he climbed down into the hole and was quickly swallowed up by the tunnel below. As I followed him down, the walls and floors all around us began to tremble. Paul's clock was striking midnight and his chimes were ringing out to tell the world that a new day was about to begin. Oh, oh, how exciting, Hazel. Sorry, I got a bit tongue-tied tongue, tongue -tied there, didn't I? Because I was getting terribly excited with that chapter. Well, we know why he knows all this, because it, it says of his days of working in the archives, so he knows the layout of the buildings and everything that he had said to Hector that he would see or touch or feel or discover actually that's exactly how it happened. So I get it now because I was thinking that chapter called Paul and the Midnight Mass. I'm thinking, who's Paul? And when he referred just now, Thomas, to Paul, here we come. He's on about St. Paul's Cathedral, isn't it? Maybe he regards it as a friend. You know, if, if, if he, yeah, he must do. I think that's lovely. So anyway, that's the end of that recording. I'm sure you've had another great day of learning, as we always do in Wolfport Farm, don't we? Uh, so I will leave it there. Have an even lovelier evening, and I'll catch up with you again tomorrow. Okay, take care. Bye for now.